Amen. My Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, God's grace, mercy, and peace are with all of you. Amen. God's word for our consideration today, a rather lengthy sermon text from Genesis chapter 6 and 7. This is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight, and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it, and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all around. Put a door on the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I'm going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, in it, everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of, of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. In the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that day all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were opened. And rain fell on the earth forty days and forty nights. On that very day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, together with his wife and the wives of his three sons, entered the ark. They had with them every wild animal according to its kind, all livestock according to their kind, every creature that moves along the ground according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, everything with wind. Pairs of all creatures that have the breath of life in them came to Noah and entered the ark. The animals going in were male and female of every living thing, as God had commanded Noah. Then the Lord shut him in. For forty days the flood kept coming on the earth. And as the waters increased, they lifted the ark high above the earth. The waters rose and increased greatly on the earth, and the ark floated on the surface of the water. They rose greatly on the earth, and all the high mountains under the entire heavens were covered. The waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 15 cubits. Every living thing that moved on land perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swarm over the earth, and all mankind. Everything on dry land that had the breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living creature on the face of the earth was wiped out, people and animals. And the creatures that move along the ground and the birds were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left, and those with him in the ark. So far, the words of our text. Have you happen to see the latest Geico ads that are out on TV? My, my family and I enjoy watching those. Those are the ads where they start with something you might find surprising. Perhaps unexpected, like a triangle solo at a, at a band concert, or the, the running of the Bulldogs in Spain, or Randy Jackson judging a dog show, or, or Casual Friday at Buckingham Palace, and of course our family favorite game night with the sloth. Right? Right, they set up these, these events that you would find surprising at the least, probably extremely unexpected, and, and they contrast it to what in their minds would be expected, which is saving money with them. Well, today we enter into the season of Advent. 
a time when we, we take a couple of weeks, not only to prepare for the, for the celebration of Christmas, but, but also to focus our attention on the second coming of Jesus and the end of the world. Many people look at the second coming of Jesus and the end of the world to be just as surprising or unexpected as those um, events listed in the Geico commercials. Their reason tells them that the earth has been going on for a long time. There's no way that this whole earth is, is just one day going to end. Many convince themselves they're accountable only to themselves. They don't have to worry about some big judging. Well, they'll have to stand before God and, and be accountable for the way that they live. Of course, God has opened our eyes to see something much different. God has led us not only to believe in, the, uh, in Jesus as our Savior and the promise of eternal life that He is waiting through Jesus, but also to believe that promise that Jesus will come back to this earth and will take with Him all those who believe into eternal life. The certainty of Christ's coming has never been in question for us. Only the, the timing. And so because of that, it isn't an event that is going to surprise us. Because of God's promise, it's not something that's unexpected for us. It's something that we're looking forward to and, and, and eagerly anticipating. It's something that we're waiting for and, and, and prepared for. You see, that's what the season of Advent is all about. Lifting our eyes off of the here and now and focusing it on that promise of Jesus to come back to this earth, both to encourage us as we live out our lives and to strengthen us in our resolve to stand firm in our faith with all the wickedness and, and godlessness in the world around us. Taking some time today to study this account of Noah will, will help us to do that. Because in that event of the flood, what was unexpected to many of the people around brought judgment, but in that same act, God brought grace and deliverance to Noah and his family who were faithful to him. And we see the very same thing happening as we look forward to the second coming of Jesus and the end of this world. And so today, through scripture, God encourages us as we wait, as we look forward to the coming of our Savior, live in expectation of Christ's deliverance. Now, the temptation when you're preaching on this text is to spend much of the time just railing on the wickedness that exists in the world around us. It's a temptation for a preacher to spend all of the focus and energy on God's judgment and how he hates wickedness. And it's a temptation to, to talk not only about the wickedness around us and God's judgment on that, but to do it in such a way that just scares God's people into making sure they're, they're ready and prepared when Jesus comes again. But certainly, we don't want people scared about the second coming of Jesus. But the truth is, all of those elements are part of this story. We see in this account, God doesn't make idle threats against sin and wickedness. He hates sin. His anger burns against sin. And we see in this account a great display of the punishment God will bring on those who, who live in this wickedness and refuse to believe in Him and heed His warnings. So certainly, there, there is a warning here for us as God's people to make sure that we're ready and prepared for that time when Jesus comes. <laughs> but as I read through that text, you also notice that this wasn't Moses' emphasis. Moses didn't emphasize the wickedness of the world around Noah. He didn't emphasize God's impending judgment, nor the catastrophic event that wiped out the population of the earth and permanently altered the face of this earth. For Moses, this was not the account of the flood. This was the account of Noah. His focus is on how Noah believed in God. 
and how Noah responded to God's directives despite all of the wickedness around him. It's an account of God's gracious deliverance of those who were faithful to him from the wickedness and the godlessness that existed around him. So if this story is about Noah, let, let's focus on Noah. We're told God came to Noah and revealed to him his plan to send a worldwide flood that would destroy all of the people on this earth. Now why would God cho choose Noah to reveal this information to you? Listen to how Moses describes Noah. He was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Now that doesn't mean Noah was without sin. No, we're told he was righteous. That is, he was declared innocent of his sin by God. The author of a letter to the Hebrews in the New Testament um, tells us that, that Noah was an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. In other words, Noah held to the faith that God would send the Messiah that he promised as a Savior who would rescue him from his sin. The fact that Noah was seen as blameless among the people and who walked faithfully with God tells us this wasn't just a faith he held in his heart. It was a faith you could see displayed in every aspect of his life. In other words, Noah lived the faith that was in his heart. We see that displayed in this account in a, in a couple of different ways. I think we see it displayed in the way that he and his wife parented their sons. Can you imagine raising three boys in, in that type of a godless environment? Yet we're told not only were Noah and his wife saved in the ark, but also his three sons and their wives. That would lead us to say they probably have that same designation of being devout and blameless. That even though Noah and his wife were on an island in this sea of godlessness, they raised their boys to believe in God and to display that in the lives that they live. We also see Noah's faith displayed in the way that he responded to God's directive. I mean, think about this. God, God comes to Noah and says, I'm going to destroy the world and all of the people in it, except for you with a flood that's going to cover the whole earth. And Noah responded, okay. And then God said, so what I want you to do is I want you to build a big boat in the middle of a desert. And Noah said, okay. And then God said, I'm going to have all the animals of this earth come to you two by two into that by, by that ark, and, and I want you to not only have enough food for yourself and, and the humans, but for all the animals. And Noah said, oh, okay. And then went about the work of doing it. I mean, that's astounding. Noah wasn't a, a, a boat builder by trade. He lived in the desert. That wouldn't have been something that just naturally came to him. And he didn't incredulously wonder how in the world God was going to do all this. And he didn't question God saying, you want me to do what? You're going to do what? He just accepted what God said and went about his work of doing that. We, we see that faithfully as Noah just continued at the task despite what was happening around him so that he was ready and prepared so that when the rains came, they could enter into the ark and be saved as God had promised. I mean, with such a wicked, violent, corrupt world, we have to imagine the, the, the ridicule and mockery that, that Noah would have had to endure. I mean, imagine how the people would have scoffed at him. He, wait, you believe God is going to send a flood that covers the whole earth and wipe us out? Imagine how they would have ridiculed him for building this large boat in the middle of the desert. Or for thinking that all of the animals of the earth were going to come two by two into this ark. Peter tells us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. That tells us his ongoing testimony about God would have been part of his daily walk with God. 
That means throughout all of this time, Noah would have continued to tell them exactly what God had said and why God had said it. And we can speculate and say probably with an encouragement that they repent and turn from their evil ways. And yet they didn't. But that didn't stop Noah. Noah stayed firm in his faith, trusting in God's promises, continuing to do what God said, even though everyone around him would have said otherwise. And when the rain started, and the floods came, and everyone else was caught by surprise in this unexpected turn of events, Noah and his family could enter into the ark with God's deliverance and be saved from this wicked world to have a better world in which they could serve and worship God. You know, if this is, account is about Noah, and about how Noah responded to God despite the wickedness around him, and about how God brought about his deliverance as, as improbable as it may have seemed, then I think the application for us is rather simple. How are we going to live and act despite the godlessness around us as we look forward to the deliverance that God promised us in Jesus when he comes again? You know, there really are only our two choices for us. We can heed this encouragement from God and live in the expectation of Christ's deliverance, or we can ignore God's warnings and live as the people of this earth, be caught by surprise and under God's judgment when He comes again. I mean, I don't like being dramatic, but it really does come down to those two choices. You know, oftentimes we try and pull out the victim card as if life is somehow much more difficult for us than it could possibly have been in, in Noah's day. But listen to how God describes Noah's day. Not, not, not just Noah, Moses, but, but how God described this. The earth was corrupt in God's sight and full of violence. I mean, does anything change in our world today? We live under that same darkness of sin that, that Noah experienced. Just like Noah, this long road of waiting for the deliverance that God promised might be a very long road. And we know all about what Moses had to I'm sorry, Noah had to endure because we get the same thing. I mean, you've probably heard people laugh at you at one time or another. You really believe God is going to come back in judgment and send people to hell just because they don't believe in Him? Unreal. Probably heard something like that. Or, or maybe you've heard this. You really think God is going to bring this world to an end? I mean, it's been around for a long time. You better give up that foolishness and live a little bit and enjoy life while you're still here and have the chance. And we face that kind of scoffing and, and mockery. And yeah, we've had that same temptation to give in, especially when it's someone that we know. Even more so, someone we respect who's laughing at us and calling us crazy because of what we believe. And if we're honest with ourselves, there's times that we've just kept our mouths shut when we heard that kind of talk going on. So as not to put ourselves in an uncomfortable situation, not to get the vitriol and the laughter and the humiliation of others, really making us just as complicit as those who, who refuse to believe. That's why we need this encouragement from Noah. We know the salvation God gives to us in Jesus. God's opened our eyes to see the forgiveness that is ours in Jesus, to, to know the certainty of eternal life. We know that what God has waiting for us is better by far. And we know that neither Christ's second coming nor the judgment that will happen is, is, is in any sort of doubt in our minds. Only the timing is uncertain. And so how important that we heed God's encouragement 
and that we live as Noah lived in expectation of Christ's deliverance. Despite what was happening around him, Noah worked and walked in the light of the Lord. He heeded God's warning. He trusted in God's promises. He watched. He waited. He prayed. Even though everyone around him told him he was crazy, he stood firm in his faith. Even though they, they told him that he was foolish for holding on to his piety, he knew they were wrong and he was right. And so he stood his ground and stood firm in his faith. And when God's kind time came and everyone else was caught by surprise, Noah enjoyed God's deliverance. As God lifted that ark and all of its precious chaos above the death and destruction below. Friends, living, looking forward to Christ's coming and living in expectation of His deliverance is going to put you and me in opposition to many people in this world. It'll bring laughter and ridicule. People will look down at us and, and, and condescend and scoff at us because of that. But it's worth holding on to. Because what God is waiting for us is better by far than what anyone here could possibly <clears throat> I mean, this account for us not only shows us God's grace toward Noah and his family, but God's grace toward us. Because you see, if God had allowed Noah and his family to be destroyed in that flood, what would have been destroyed with them would also have been the promise of the Savior. God had promised the Savior would come through them. And without that promise, if that promise would have died, you and I would have no Savior. We would, would stand here today without hope. So God not only had Noah and his family in mind when he saved them on the ark, he you and me in mind too. And that same God in his grace has come to us with a promise that he will rescue us, has rescued us from sin and in eternity in hell. <laughs> Because of Jesus, our Savior. Trust in God's promises. Hold tightly to the faith that God has given to you in Jesus. Look forward with eager anticipation to the time when Jesus comes again. And as you wait, live in the expectation of Christ's deliverance.